Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to today's online service. I trust you've had a good week. I trust you've kept safe and you're well wherever you find yourselves this morning, in your bedroom, your living room, wherever it is. Um, but I trust you've, you've gathered, gathered those around you and we are ready to hear from the Lord this morning. And I just realized for myself how easily we can, we can come into the presence of the Lord or into a service, especially when we're at home and and not be expecting something from the lord not be wanting something from the lord asking the lord for something and so my encouragement to you this morning as we come into the presence of the lord as we worship him and as we hear that word from him that we come with with something in our hearts that we're desiring from the lord and and jesus said in the sermon on the mount in matthew 7 verse 7 he says ask and it will be given to you Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And so this morning as we, as we worship the Lord, let's remember that we have a, a Father in heaven and he, he wants to answer our prayers. But I think it's important for us to come with that heart expecting, what is it this morning that you want the Lord to do for you? And let's trust the Lord that as we hear from Him, He will make things clear, He will reveal things to our hearts and He will give uh, an answer uh, to, to our requests. Amen. Good morning, my brothers and sisters, precious brothers and sisters. We are precious because God has made us precious. We are precious, first of all, to the Lord, and He has called us to serve Him. And today we can lift our voices in praise to Him. And every day is a day or an opportunity for us to be thankful to the Lord for what He has done. And this is the song that we're going to start with today. It's called Every Day we see the faithfulness of the Lord on our lives. Amen. Every day, every day I thank you, Jesus, for every day. Every day, every day I thank you, Jesus, for every day. In the morning, Thank you. 
and I'm being reminded that uh, it's time for the offering. And as we sit in our homes, uh, in the comfort of our homes this morning, what a grace, what a privilege it is to be able to support the work of God, to be able to know that your offering, it's not just going uh, nowhere, but the Lord is using it to construct his church. And I want to encourage each and every one of us to continue to look to God, to continue to trust him, to meet our needs, to continue to just be grateful to the Lord for how he has taken care of us. But most importantly, to continue to support the work of God and the kingdom of God. That is the most important investment we can ever make in our lives. I encourage you this morning to give to the Lord as freely, as, as, as willingly as you would in a normal church service and never to forget the privilege that we have to be able to participate in the construction of God's church, the spiritual church. And may the Lord bless you this morning as we give off the offering and um, just look on the screen, the church banking details follow and uh, may the Lord bless you in this wonderful privilege and grace that we have. Amen. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. What a joy and privilege to be with you this morning. And uh, thank you so much, Brother Eugene, for that wonderful time of worship that has prepared our hearts for God's word this morning. So I am certainly glad in my heart for the word of God. And we know that the word of God is living. It's uh, powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the very thoughts and the intents of our hearts. And uh, certainly that there's no creature that's hidden from the sight of, of God and that all things will one day be exposed because uh, his eyes are open and we will have to give an account to him. So may the word of God continue to discover our state May it continue to be our source, our food, our nourishment, our joy, and uh, may we continue to certainly dwell in it uh, more and more. So much so as we see the day of the Lord approaching. The Word of God is so needed in these times that we're living in. And so let's pray this morning uh, for this time and commit this meeting into the Lord's hands. Father, we are so grateful for the ministry of your Spirit. We're so grateful for your Word, that, Lord, you will speak through your Holy Spirit and reveal your truth to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that as I stand here this morning, may people not see me, Lord, but may they see you. May they see your heart. May they receive your love. May I just be an instrument, Lord, nothing else, Father just a vessel to bring your word and Lord to speak what your spirit puts on my heart this morning. Father, I thank you that may we continue to see the cross of Christ before us and Jesus himself revealed to us clearer and clearer. I ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, this morning I'd like to share about major and minor issues. Hey, I'm certainly not a musician, but major and minor issues. And you know, the devil knows that if he can get us to focus on anything other than Jesus Christ and him crucified, then he has us majoring on the minor issues and he has us diverted from God's purpose for our lives. And the devil uses many things to get us to waste our time on futile pursuits that rob us of our devotion, of our wholeheartedness, of our commitment to the Lord and to his plan and to his purpose for his church in these last days. And that's why there is such a, a heaviness in my heart 
to remind us again and again that we should always have in focus what are the major issues? What is the purpose of my Christian life? Why am I living on this earth? What am I doing with my time? How am I serving the Lord? How am I living my life? How am I in my home? How is the state of my marriage? We should always be focusing on the major issue, which is to be conformed and to know Christ, to be conformed into his image and to become a spiritual people. That's the only job. That's the only role. That's the reason we are alive, to serve God, to be pleasing to him and to glorify him, to be like him and to remember that the rest are just minor issues. To allow God and his Holy Spirit to reveal to us things in our lives that may be distracting us, may be consuming us, may be causing us to always be focused and running after the minor issues. As that statement in the world goes, sometimes we are chasing rabbits and I believe it means that when, when you're chasing rabbits, you are, you've lost sight of the real goal of things, of life, of the purpose of what you're doing, why you're doing something. And you begin to you know, chase the rabbits and you begin to follow the red herrings, things that are not even um, um, substantial. And none of us want to be like that, but we want to keep the ultimate goal the ultimate goal. And that's why I felt in my heart this morning to share with you about major and minor issues. If you have your Bible, I'd like us to turn and to see a couple of examples in the Bible this morning. And we'll start with the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10 from verse 38. Oh, I love the gospel. I love the gospel and I just know that today if I am where I am, it's because of the grace of God. And to remember that we can do nothing. We've done nothing to deserve what, what the Lord has given to us. The gospel that has been revealed to our hearts, so precious, so real. The family of God that we are part of. We have done absolutely nothing. The testimonies that we've heard from the Build 2 conference, all the leaders that have been touched, over 25,000 leaders have heard the gospel. We, have, we can do, we, we, nothing can be attributable to any man, but it's all glory, all honor to the Lord himself. And that's why we are reminded in Ephesians that it is by, it is by grace that we've been saved. Eh? Uh, through faith, not of ourselves. It was a gift of God. And that... The reason was so that no man would ever boast. No one would say it was because of my works, it was because of my title, my experience, my color, my culture, my, my background. No, it's the grace of God. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, for without me you can do nothing. And that's why as I stand before you this morning, church, I realize that it's not me. Unless the Holy Spirit speaks to us this morning, all the words that I speak can be nothing. So may the Lord open our ears, all of us, and bring us to love and to appreciate the Word of God. To love the Word like never before. So if you are, if you are there in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, we will read the story of these two precious sisters. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, 
You are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. That is the word of the Lord this morning. I just want to highlight a few things that I, that I saw in this passage concerning major and, mi and minor issues. And the problem here in verse 40, the problem is, was not Martha's serving. It was that Martha was worried and distracted. And you see, when you're worried and distracted, you lose focus of the very purpose of hospitality. It's to focus on your guest. And there she is, so worried, so anxious, so distracted, that she is not truly present with Jesus in the room or in the house. She's busy, probably preparing a meal. And her, her, her busyness, her anxiety, her distraction leads her and brings a wedge, almost a, 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 a struggle or a, a conflict between her and her sister and her and Jesus. She says, Jesus, tell my sister to do what I am doing. And she accuses Jesus of not being concerned for her. She says, Lord, do you not care? I mean, it's amazing how I, I, I can just imagine Jesus just sitting there with, you know, a surprised look on his face, like, what's wrong? I was just minding my business, talking to, to Mary, and now you're accusing me of not caring for you. And now Martha wants Jesus to tell Mary to join him in her serving, in her busyness, in whatever she was doing. So it's almost like Jesus was going to be left alone in the house. So what's the point? The very guest that you've invited, he is now not even useful to anybody. And so it was her anxiety and her distraction that was a concern. You see? And when you are worried and distracted, it leaves no room for the most important part, which was giving attention to Jesus, giving attention to attention to your guest. And here was Jesus, the very saviour of the world, in their house. And here was an opportunity. And you see the attitude of the two sisters, the difference, how Mary put aside what she needed to do, whatever she needed to do. She put it aside. She put aside the minor issues, the preparing, the, the fussing, the readiness, the, you know, all the, the glitz and glamour that we can sometimes get, get ourselves caught up in. And she desired to sit at Jesus' feet, to receive the truth and the grace that was coming, to hear from the Spirit of God himself. She had that attitude where she was willing to learn. She was submissive. She was not wanting to be distracted in anything whatsoever. In some versions uh, of, of um, the King James versions, I think uh, the King James version says encumbered. She was not distracted, but uses the word encumbered. And um, I think the Greek word talks about somebody who's been pulled in different directions. You've been, you've been, you know, you've been, um, your focus is everywhere. You're being pulled from pillar to post, as they say. And so she had no joy. There was no longer a joy. There was no longer peace. There was now no longer a love, an appreciation for what she was doing. Now there's strife. She looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, you don't care for me. She looks at her sister and says, Jesus, tell my sister to do what I am doing. And you see, we can be so busy. And every church needs Martha's. I mean, I'm not, I'm not belittling the Martha's at all. Every church needs Martha's, but every church too needs the Marys. We need Marys who realize what the major issue is. It's to know Christ, to hear his word, 
to sit at his feet and to be like that early church in Acts chapter 2 where daily they sat at the feet of the apostles. They broke bread, they prayed, and they had fellowship. That attitude needs to dwell in us, especially in this busy season, where we need to put aside and not seek to gain more fluff, more distraction, not seek to allow our worry, because we're living in a, in a time when the world is so hectic. Everything around us and is, is so hectic and such, at such pace, and everything is now. Everything has to be done instantly. Everybody feels now, now. No one is waiting upon the Lord. No one wants to sit at his feet anymore. No one wants to, to, to have an attitude of heart where, Lord, reveal, speak to me. I wait upon you. Renew my strength. Before I rush out and just do things, Lord, I want to know your heart, your direction. I want to feel what is your purpose. I want to be one with you in what I am doing today. I want to know your will. I want to do your will. And that's why much of what we worry about today, my brothers and sisters, is not important in the larger scheme of things. I promise you, if you look at everything that we fuss and fret over, it's not important. It's the minor, minor issue. Our desire, our heart is beating for another kingdom. And that's why, you know, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with providing for our family. There's nothing wrong with wanting our kids to have a secure future. There's nothing wrong in serving our neighbors. There's nothing wrong in serving the Lord. There's nothing wrong in pursuing a career, in pursuing studies. But at the end of the day, we need to choose and to make the right choices in our daily lives, to choose to listen to his word, to choose to allow God to reveal more and more of himself in our lives. That's why Paul's prayer Everywhere, as he closes his epistles, he says, you know, he prays that you may grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was always Paul's desire, that the early Christians would grow in the knowledge of Christ, grow in the knowledge of him, of his purpose, of his plan, of his will, and know him more, that they may know him more in the spirit and so we see these two sisters and in verse 41 Jesus answers and says Martha Martha you are worried and troubled about many things it wasn't the serving it was the worry and the trouble that Jesus discerned and saw in Mary and when we are worried and troubled which is again because of life situations it distracts us from the very major issue of knowing and dwelling and spending time with Christ. And so we see the story, and everywhere throughout the Bible, Jesus warned and kept warning the people that prepare, prepare your hearts, watch what is happening, discern the times, don't just be carried away by everything that is happening around us, but be watchful, be prayerful, do not fall into temptation. All these warnings that have been given to us, my brothers and sisters, through the Word of God. And that's why the Word of God is so important for our lives, because it instructs us how to live, how to serve the Lord better, how to follow Him, how to be obedient to Him. And my desire, my prayer, is that I may be more and more submitted and obedient to his word. In fact, Jesus himself warns us in Matthew chapter 25, we read the story of the ten virgins, the five foolish and the five wise virgins. And we know the story how these virgins were waiting for the bridegroom, they were part of the wedding, and they all went to sleep and they slumbered. And when the, the bridegroom uh, announced, finally announced his arrival, um, 
how at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 25 from verse 6. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones, the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. I mean, the oil speaks of the, the Holy Spirit, the anointing of God, and how that can't be shared. You know, you can't, you can't transmit my anointing or Peter's anointing. Peter can't transmit his anointing to somebody, you know. And how each one of us, it speaks of a state of readiness. And in verse 8 it says, And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. This parable just speaks to me about a call for readiness for his second coming. And how we can never become complacent, my brothers and sisters. We need more faith. We need more love. We need more patience. We need more of the Holy Spirit. We need a deeper work of God in our hearts. None of us can say we are okay. None of us can say we're a finished product. We need more of Christ in us. We need to know Him more. We need to fellowship with Him more. We need to be strengthened with Him more. We need to know the voice of the shepherd. We need to re be reminded of His word and to, to always be reminded and to, 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 to keep in focus what needs to be kept in focus. Hey? It's like a cameraman taking a picture, you know, and, and minimizing the background, but always focusing and keeping in focus, what, what, peop, what he needs people to focus on. And that's why, you know, Apostle Paul is our great and wonderful example. He says in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you, it is safe. And I believe one of the greatest ways that Christians learn is we need to keep being reminded. One plus one, two. One plus one, two. One plus one, two. Because the world today is trying to make us think, you know, deception is coming, that one plus one will give you a different answer. The simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of what Christ has achieved for us, will always remain two, and that should always remain the focus. And Apostle Paul goes on in that chapter, Philippians chapter 3, to remind us again of the major issues, his ultimate goal, his priority, the priority of his Christian faith, the priority of his Christian life, the race that he was running. He says in Philippians chapter 3 from verse 8, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Do you see a man who could compare? I'm ready to lose that because it's more excellent to know Christ. Simple. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Again. He says, I suffered loss, I counted all these things as rubbish, but look what I have gained, Christ. These things are all minor, my possessions, my qualifications, my heritage. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, 
I was taught by Gamaliel. I, I was a Pharisee amongst Pharisees. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. I was born of the stock of Israel. I mean, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. All these things, I count them loss compared to what I have gained, Christ. Very simple. He didn't allow the enemy. He didn't allow anything to distract him. He didn't want anyone to distract him. He wanted to run his race and to complete it. And in verse, verse 9, he continues, And that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God, by faith. So again, he says, I could easily have my own righteousness. I could easily trust in my flesh, trust in myself. But that's not the righteousness I want. I want the one that comes through Christ. I want the one that is being formed through fire. The one that Christ himself has granted to me. The one that does not come because of my works, because of what I have done, because of who I am, because of my title, because of my knowledge, because of my experience. But I want the one that is found through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. In other words, because of what I have lived, the holy, the sanctified, the pure life, Christ has given me a faith, a measure of faith to be able to serve him, to respond and to please him. Paul knew. Paul didn't walk by sight, but he walked by faith. Because that's the type of faith that we're going to need in these last days. We're not going to need a faith that sees the minor issues, that sees all the weaknesses, the struggles, the challenges, and sees all the difficulties, but the faith to come to the feet of Jesus and the faith to, to respond, the faith for my spiritual life, not faith for things, but faith to please the Lord. That's the faith that we need, my brothers. Faith to stand. Faith to face the trials and the tests of life. Faith to accept the hand of God upon my life. Faith to persevere. Faith to, to face the temptations, to grow, to accept whatever God wants. Faith for my marriage. Faith for my children. Faith for the ministry. Faith for the church. That's the faith that we need. Not faith to possess. Not faith to, 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 to be the head and not the tail. Faith for, to respond to God's spiritual plan for my life. That's what Paul wanted. In verse 10, he continues and he says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Paul did not major on the minor issues, but he kept the major issues before him. The major issue before Paul was that he would, he would reach forward to those things which are ahead, that he would not count himself to understand anything, but he would always desire to leave his past, to not allow anything to distract him, to consume him, to, to cause his eyes to come off the goal. And he wanted to know, why has Christ laid hold of my life? What has Christ got for me? What is Christ's purpose and plan for me? And that's why I don't believe anyone as a Christian should be happy with this world should be content in this world. We should all be looking to Jesus, looking for a home that he has gone to prepare for us. We should all be desiring to say, Lord, I don't want to waste my Christian life. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to be caught up in fables and false and fake. And I don't want to follow another Jesus. I don't want to be caught up in another spirit. I don't want to be swallowed by the spirit of the world. I want to hear your call. I want to hear your voice. I want to see and keep my eyes on you. Hey? You know, it's so hard to see 
when my eyes are on me, when my eyes are on myself. It's so hard to see what God has for me. And that's why we need to keep our eyes firmly fixed on Him, our hearts firmly focused on Him. That's why in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus spoke about serving two masters. And again, for me, it just speaks about somebody who it's very hard to do major and minor things. It's very hard to enter a, a, a you know, to serve two masters, as it says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. No one can do major and minor. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot, my brothers and sisters, you cannot be pleasing. You cannot be satisfied with yourself, with your life. With, we cannot grow. We cannot be conformed into His image. We cannot change. We cannot have hearts that are on fire and hearts that are in the world at the same time. We cannot have one foot in this world and one foot in the church. We cannot. We cannot. We cannot. It's impossible. It's impossible. Either you will focus on the minor and you'll neglect the major. But one thing is required, that we focus on the major, that we may know him and neglect the minor. You know, like I said earlier, there are some things that we don't need to do today. They're not important. In the big scheme of things, they're not important. They add no value. You know, it's like what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, verse 25. That which one of us by worrying can add one single hair to their head? Can add one cubit? Can add one cubit to their stature, sorry. Which one of us by worrying and fretting and, and being distracted and, and consumed? None of us. It doesn't help. It doesn't add any value to our spiritual walk. That's why we should leave all things to the Lord. As it says in Philippians, be anxious for nothing, but in prayer and supplication, let our requests be made known to Christ. Oh, I love the word of God. I love the word of God. And that's why we need to keep the major issues in focus. We need to keep our binoculars focused and to say no, I don't want to see the rats and the mice. I want to see the big elephant. I want to see Christ. I want to see the church. I want to see my place. I want to keep my vision 2020. I want to, you know, it's like people wear glasses. Oh, well, I used to wear glasses. I now wear contacts. I remember my glasses and, you know, you just, every time you would put them on, you would quickly see if they were dirty, the lenses were dirty. And you quickly take them off, wipe, use a lens cloth, put them on. And now you can see again. But there are times when you don't see, you get so busy, you drive and you're distracted, and suddenly you can get so used to seeing through uh, clouded lenses. And that's not what the Lord wants. He wants to come today like the Holy Spirit and just cleanse our glasses, clean and remove all the, 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 the smudges, the, the, the finger marks and let us see again. And we desire and say, Lord, I want to see clearly. I don't want to be a busybody. I don't want to be, you know, to, to, to lose sight of what is the focus. What is the major issue here? It's to know you. It's to please you. I don't want my December to go wasted. I don't just want to run from pillar to post and be doing so many little things. At the end of the day, I'm left tired, confused, frustrated, no joy, no peace. I don't feel fulfilled in my Christian life. But Lord, I want to dwell in your word. I want to know you through your word, through your scriptures. And let's allow the Holy Spirit to reveal God's heart to us through his word. 
It's waiting for us, my brothers and sisters. The richness of the Word of God. It's so rich, so alive, so good for each one of us. And that's why we're living in very perilous times. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in these last days. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24 and read what the days of Noah were like so that we can be reminded and be careful and be prepared for the days that are coming. In Matthew chapter 24 from verse 36 it says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So Jesus is saying, no one knows the day and the hour that I will return. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. <laughs> then the rain came and they could see that this crazy Noah for a hundred years building an ark, he had warned us. Verse 39, And did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. In other words, watch. Don't be distracted. Don't be taken up by minor issues. Don't allow your, our hearts to grow cold. Respond to the call of God. Do not become deaf to His call, to His plan. Take advantage of all the warnings, of all the prophecies, Take advantage of the Word of God. You know the CTMI website has got so much material, my brothers and sisters. So many messages, testimonies, songs, books by precious brothers, elders, by precious uh, sisters. There's ladies' meetings, there's conferences. We have got no excuse not to be well fed. No excuse not to dwell in the Word of God. Watch. Watch therefore, take advantage to grow in the faith, to grow in our love for the word, to grow in prayer. And I speak to you, but I'm speaking to myself. I'm challenging myself this morning. And that we need to, to almost hold one another accountable and to take advantage of all this material that is there for us, that is available for us. The word of God, the preachings, the messages. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. Be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Ah, I tell you, as it was in the days of Noah, no one believed that the rains were coming. As it is in these days, no one believes. No one, it's almost like the world is just becoming a lull. The Christian world is, has just become so comfortable, so used to the day, the headlines of today. Nobody wants to watch. Nobody is discerning the times. And yet, at the same time, the voice of God is there. I mean, last week I was listening to a, prof a prophecy from Brother Mickey, so clear. So clear, so, so relevant for this time. Separate ourselves from this world. How the world is in a mess. How the world is, 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 is upside down. And it's impossible for a Christian not to listen to that prophecy and be moved in their hearts and to say, Lord, may I be ready. May I be prepared. And for the fear of God to come back and to, to seize my heart and to say, Lord, I, want, I don't want to slumber. I don't want to become like the world. I don't want to flow in the same direction. I don't want to become used 
and to, to love the world or to love the things of the, Lord, of the world. Otherwise, the, the love of Christ is not in me. The Bible is very clear about that. That's why, my brothers and sisters, we need to be warned. We need to be alarmed. We need to be shaken. We need to not become complacent. We need to, to not fall asleep, to not slumber, to not become like those five foolish virgins, to not become like the people in the days of Noah, to not become, but to watch, to be ready, to watch and to be ready, to, to take off our glasses and to watch, to make sure that we've got 2020 vision, that we're seeing clearly God's plan. We're seeing clearly the major, major issue is what am I doing with my life? Amen? We are warned. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, again another warning through the Spirit of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1. It's very clear. Paul speaks and he writes and he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Oh, if the enemy can get us to just say, These are not the last days. There's more. I've still got my life to live. I've still got things to enjoy. Come on, Lord. These are not the last days. Please, postpone the last days by another 20 years. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Read this, these next three chapters just in your own time. Verse 3, verse 2, sorry. Verse 3 and verse 4. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of of godliness, but denying its power. Eh? These will be men who will speak the Christianese. They'll say the right Christian words. They will be religious. They will have the Christian language. They will, Monday to, you know, on Sunday, they will be at church. They will be in the right committees. They will say the right things, but their life will not identify fully. They will not be truly disciples of Jesus. They will not be living a life where they deny themselves. They pick up their cross and they follow Jesus daily. The power of God will not be in them. The power of the ministry of the Holy Spirit will not be there. Paul says, and from such people, turn away. They will have a form outwardly. They will be like Pharisees. Outwardly, they will say the right things. They will participate. They will have no problem to give. They will have no problem to, to invite people. They will have no problem with the church. But their lives will be limited. They will just say, mm, only so far. I'll only give my life so far. We don't, want, we don't want to be Christians like that. We want to be wholehearted, committed, devoted, completely in it, eh? in it to win it, in it to finish the race, in it to allow Christ to change us and transform us, in it to live a pure, a holy, a sanctified life, in it to, to run for that eternal hope, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, in it to get to heaven, in it to finish well, eh? as Jesus it welcomes us into heaven, you'll be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come, enter into your rest. Amen? We don't want to do half measures. Right? We don't want to just focus on minor issues, but to focus on the major issues. Let's look again at the heart of Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. I just love how Paul was able to, to keep so focused. And he says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, we are privileged that God would reveal the message of the cross to our hearts and bring revelation, Paul is saying. And he says, I have this treasure in my heart that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of me. 
In other words, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, He will do. He will take me through the trials, the tests, the tribulations. And then Paul begins to outline situations in his life, things that he's lived. The attitude in the heart of this man is just so pleasing, such an example, so challenging. He says in verse 8, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. I mean, the modern day Christians can, modern day Christianity cannot allow us to say this. Okay? Hard pressed on every side, which means, where is the Lord? But Paul is saying, I understand. This is part of my walk. This is part of my call. This is part of what the Lord has clearly said to me. This is part of what I have lived. I'm hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. We'll see why. I'm persecuted, but I'm not forsaken. I am struck down, but I'm not destroyed. I'm always carrying about me in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in my body. That was Paul understood and he, as he took his cross, as he died to himself, he knew that as there was death working in him, the life of Christ was being revealed and given to him at the same time. In verse 11, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life is in you. Ah, Paul. Paul, I mean, for him, it was clear. I have no problem to die to myself. I have no problem to be beaten, to be persecuted, to be, to be least of the apostles. I have no problem to suffer for Christ because I know what it is producing in me and what it is producing in you is the life of Christ. You become carriers of the life of Christ when you focus on the major issue, which is knowing Christ. That's why Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse, um, verse 1, he says, for, verse 2, sorry, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That, that was Paul's resolution, determination, focus. That was a man who was majoring on the major issue. I determine, I'm coming to you. I have heard that there is division amongst you. I have heard that some of you are saying, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, I am of Christ. I mean, there was such division that some were saying, I am of Christ, I am of this one. What is, and Paul asks them, is Christ divided? He asked them, was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, I am nothing. I thank God, he says, that I baptized none of you. And yet, he says, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. Again, Paul, wonderful man of, of comparison. I'm coming to you in fear and trembling. I don't want you to put glory in me, in my teaching, in human wisdom, in my words. No, I want you to put your faith in the power of the, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul always wanted the Christians, their faith, their focus, their, their, their life, to be fully in Christ. He always pointed them to Christ. He always pointed them to the cross. He always pointed them to the Jesus Christ, which one? the one crucified, the one who died for you, the one who rose after three days, 
the one who lives and reigns and rules and is seated at the right hand of the Father, the one who's interceding for you right now. That's the Jesus that Paul pointed people to. Not the Jesus that is there to bless me, to take care of me, to prosper me, to give me this, to give me that. No, the crucified one, the one who died for you and I. That's why Paul says, I determined, I determined, I determined to know nothing amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul had one vision, one purpose, one goal, to know Christ, to know Christ. And I tell you, my brothers and sisters, let us not be distracted. Let us not allow the enemy to consume us, to distract us, to bring division, to cause us to run after futile things, to rob us of our time, of our devotion to Christ. Let us spend time as a family, praying together, seeking his heart, seeking his direction, seeking his plan, seeking his will, seeking his, 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 him and him alone, seeking more of him, seeking to decrease that he may increase. That's our purpose. That's why we've been saved. That's why we've been bought at a price. That's why we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That we will not live for ourselves, but we will live for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, Jesus, that you have a plan for us. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. Oh, Lord, give us this heart like you. Give us your heart, Lord Jesus. Oh, that's why I love the heart of Apostle Paul. He knew that when he, even when he was weak, he could be strong because of the grace of God. You see, we are nothing, my brothers. We can do nothing. It's all the grace of God. It's all because of him. It's all because of him. And even Paul in Galatians chapter 6 he says, oh, woe be me if I boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ. He, took, he did not want any glory. He took nothing. He says, God forbid. God forbid. God stop me. Stop my mouth. Close me. Strike me down that I should boast. Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Major, minor. I want to be crucified to the world? It comes through the cross of Christ. I have been crucified. In other words, there's been a separation. I've been separated from the world. I no longer desire the things of the world, but I desire Christ. God forbid that this separation could only come through a work of the cross of Jesus Christ in my heart. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2 verse 20, again he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So many times we want the life of Christ, but we don't want the death that comes. Eh? We want to carry his life, but we don't want to die to ourselves. It's impossible. One is as a result of the other. I need to, we need to be crucified with him. We need to die to ourselves, die to our ambitions, our plans, Die to our minor issues. Die to our complaining, our groaning, our strives, our, our comparisons. Die to all these things that Christ may be found in us. There's another verse that I love in Hebrews chapter 12 that just reminds us again of how we, we all just need to adjust our focus. We all need to remember that our eyes need to be on Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, one of my favorite verses, verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, which witnesses? 
the ones that are spoken about in Hebrews chapter 11, the patriarchs of our, of our faith, Abraham, Moses, Joseph, Jacob, all these guys, and how the Lord used them. And then it says, let us lay aside every weight, every minor issue, let it aside. Leave it. It's not worth it. It's distracting us. It's consuming you. It's robbing you of precious, valuable time. Lay it aside. God will take care of it. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto us. And the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Ah, there's been a race that is set before us, my brothers and sisters. It's not our race. It's just things that are going to happen in our lives. Situations, tests, hardships, struggles, challenges, lacks, difficulties, illness, sickness, death. All these things, they will come into our lives. But we are not in control. It's the race that the Lord has set before us. We've already been, it's already been planned. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What I like about verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. You know, as I said earlier, I think that it's so hard to see when our eyes are on ourselves. But when our eyes are on Jesus, it completely reveals another different picture. It gives us faith. It gives us hope. It gives us an endurance. It allows us to see the race. It allows us to keep our eyes on the race. And it says, looking unto Jesus, not looking unto man. Don't look to the patriarchs of faith. It would be so much easier to look unto a man. It would be so much easier when we compare ourselves. When we say, why can't I worship like that one? Why can't I pray like that one? Why can't I serve like that one? You see, it's so easy in the church to compare and to want to be like somebody else. But Jesus is saying, don't compare yourself. The author of the book of Hebrews is saying, don't compare because your race has been set before you by the Lord. It's your race. It's your box. It's specific to you. No one can copy it. We are all members of the body, but different parts. So each one of us has got a different function. Don't try and be like the other. Oh, this is so precious. So as I close... I want to read one last scripture from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. I want to encourage all of us to really ask the Lord to show us minor issues that are distracting us, that have become so major, whether it's strife, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's it's, it's situations that have happened, things that have been said, things that we feed upon, things that we make so huge, yet they don't need to be in the grand scheme of things. The grand scheme of things is, am I knowing Him? Am I loving Him? Am I becoming like Him? Vanity. Remember Solomon says, it's all vanity at the end of the day. Life. What is important is to fear the Lord and to love Him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. Ah, this is so wonderful. Whether we are alive or we are dead, we make it our aim to be pleasing to Him. You know, it's very hard to reach, to hit a target when you're not aiming for something. It's very hard to just go through life aimlessly, to just depend for our faith, to depend 
on people that are ahead of us. But when we ourselves are knowing Christ, when we ourselves are sitting at his feet, when we ourselves have a revelation of him, when he opens our eyes, when he opens our ears, when we love God's word, when we desire it, we can know and hear from the Lord ourselves. We can be pleasing to him. We can know that we are confident, well pleased. Rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My brothers and sisters, we all need to live with eternity in mind. Our life on this earth is very, very temporary. Very, very temporary. Whether it's 80 years, 90 years, in comparison to eternity, it's a small bit. It's a tiny, tiny bit. Every single day of our lives is one day closer to the return of Jesus. Every single day of our lives is one day closer to him coming back. And we need to live in a permanent state of readiness, of preparedness, of watchfulness, a state where any minute, we, 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 every minute, sorry, we make it our aim. We aim to please him. Morning, afternoon, evening. Lord, how can I please you? Lord, show me. Lord, I want to do your will. Lord, especially as these are the end times, my brothers and sisters, each one of us need to be aware, to be ready, to not stay ignorant of God's word, to be ready to obey and to submit ourselves fully to the word of God. And that I, I, I don't want to fall away. I don't want to be people and to feel that, you know, I'm no longer aware of God's call. I'm no longer responsive. I'm sluggish. I am lethargic. But may the Holy Spirit seize our hearts that none of us would fall away. None of us would fall away. That we would all be kept by Him. That the Good Shepherd would feed us and lead us and guide us day by day as long as we're willing to yield and to submit to Him. So as I close, <clears throat> let's remember that these are the end times and... Uh, all of us should be aware, should be ready, should not stay ignorant of the Word of God, but desire to glory and to obey His Word and to submit ourselves entirely to Him. Uh, I don't want any of us, I'm sure, even for Peter, that none of us would fall away. And we continue, want to continue to respond to the call of God and to allow the Holy Spirit to seize our hearts. So may the Lord enlighten us concerning the scriptures that we have read this morning because that's his will, that's his heart, that's his desire for each one of us to finish the race. So let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that he would reveal this word to our hearts, that none of us would deny the Lord in any way, would not be distracted, we would be refocused, that, Lord, we would put our priorities where our priorities need to be put and we'll draw our hearts closer and closer to you. May we not fall asleep. May we not become lukewarm. May we not backslide, Lord. But, Father, may we finish our race well. And, Lord, I pray for your grace to come upon our lives. That, Father, where we are going through tough and trying times, Lord, help us to keep our eyes firmly on you. Thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you may touch all those who are sick in their bodies and that you may restore and renew them in body, mind and soul. Thank you, Lord, for our precious brothers and sisters. Heal them, comfort them, Lord. For those who are suffering, those who have lost loved ones, Lord, provide them with the relief that they need. Help them to endure right until the end. I pray and I ask all of this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. Amen. So brothers and sisters, enjoy your time with the family, with friends. Please join us online every week until the end of December. We'll be meeting online and I invite you to share this message. Spread the word. 
in, uh, send the link to family, to friends, to Christians who are discouraged, who are backslidden, who are off the race. And let us rejoice in the word of the Lord. Rejoice and allow the joy of the Lord to be our strength in these uncertain and perilous times. So I love you and thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Amen.